Okay, thanks everybody for uh, joining us for our next session. Our next speaker is Sandy Seiberg. He's a co-founder and president of Purple Cow Organics, a recognized leader in the field of organic soil amendments. He's also a certified organic farmer in East Central Wisconsin where he produces a variety of food, grain, and seed crops. And he's going to be speaking to us this morning on growing your own nitrogen, leveraging diverse rotations to manage nutrients and reduce input costs. Andy? Good morning, everybody. Everybody hear me? I don't know why we can turn this up. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm not going to eat it. You were eating it last time, so I don't do that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Can everybody hear me now? All right, perfect. So good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for that nice introduction. Um, and obviously, as an organic farmer, um, you know, my background is I was fortunate enough to grow up on a farm <coughs> that never transitioned to conventional. Um, it was uh, bought by my great grandfather in the 1890s. Uh, I can either be referred to as a third generation or a first generation farmer because uh, after the barn burnt down uh, by my grandfather burning rubbish next to it, he didn't let my father. Uh, you need to hear me better? Yeah, if there's any way to turn it up. I don't know where the volume is for this. Maybe you could check. Um, anyhow, the, so the, the barn burnt down, cows went away. My grandfather, end, or my father, ended up being an engineer and was pretty adamant about me not getting into farming. It wasn't until uh, my gr grandfather had a little bit of influence on uh, keeping the farm going uh, that I got back into it in the 80s. Um, you know, a lot of their work was done uh, reading things at the turn of the century, you know, Sir Albert Howard, uh, you know, J.I. Rodale, you know, pretty much the standard what we see now, uh, you know, in the lens to sort of the foundation of organic farming, you know, were people that were really... Um, you know, not pushing back against the green revolution, uh, you know, the understanding that uh, synthetic fertilizers were going to be the, the new up and coming thing. I really believe that the people that could take the Haber Bosch process, I'm sure a lot of people in here know about that, uh, and, and transition that uh, ability to make ammonium, nit you know, ammonium nitrate, <coughs> which was previously used to make bombs, into something that could be used as a fertilizer was a good thing. You know, my grandmother, uh, along with her two sisters, my great aunts, you know, managed a five acre vegetable garden, which is now pretty much what people are running from a CSA standpoint. And my job as an eight year old was to make compost for that vegetable, you know, uh, operation that they had. So that's how I got into the composting business was mainly because I noticed that my brother who was 12 could drive the truck on the road without a driver's license. And at eight, I wanted that job. <laughs> so I took the composting job really as a way to drive the farm pickup truck on the road w w without a license. But my grandmother um, literally would, would stop by at neighbors' houses who were burning leaves in the fall. I'd crouch down in the seat of her car because I didn't want them to see me. She'd get out and she'd shake her hand at him uh, and tell him to put the fire out. And then my brother and I would come the next day, load the leaves up you know, for the compost pile. And you know, her constant mantra from as long as I could remember was feed the soil, feed the soil, feed the soil. So she understood for some reason, um, you know, at that point in time when agriculture was transitioning uh, to the use of other inputs, that there was still this potentially inherent way that had worked for centuries, for millennia, uh, from the standpoint of agricultural production. <clears throat> so that, that's an expansion on the... Oh, okay. We got technical assistance here. Is that better? Can you hear me better in the back? All right. Thank you. All right. So, um, you know, in looking at, you know, talking to a group of farmers, there's one thing as a farmer myself, um, you know, that it's a bit intimidating to look out into a room because, you know, everybody's out there doing the best job that they can. And everybody has a different farm. Everybody has a different history. Um, you know, and, and everybody has a different method with which to do that. So, you know, this quote from uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, as to methods, there are millions and then, and then some, <clears throat> but principles are few. So the man who grasps 
principals can successfully select his own method. So, you know, these were ways that I was brought up as a young person and eventually a young farmer, you know, and ultimately in an interaction, I think certainly uh, most beautifully within the organic movement, is that everybody understands that there's different backgrounds and different decisions. There's people that drive green tractors and red tractors, right? And we all, we all still get along. So just a show of hands, who carries a shovel in their pickup truck? Nice. You'd be surprised. I mean, those people that carry them, you would be surprised how many times I'll ask that question and not a, not a hand in the room will go up, whether it's organic or conventional farmers. So, you know, uh, personal observation, there's a great vet who just recently retired from Organic Valley, uh, Dr. Paul, and one of his most stringent lines is the, uh, you know, the, the most reliable source of truth is personal observation. So I recommend, you know, that that if you're not carrying a shovel with you, you know, that you, that you do that. Um, you know, seeing your soil, having an understanding. I was with a farmer who were transitioning a couple thousand acres for a local uh, businessman who used to own a dairy, uh, dairy processing plant. And he's uh, uh, since gone into a farmland preservation operation with the funds that he got from selling that business. And he wants the land transitioned to organic. And the farmer that we met with out there uh, on, a, on a particular field that was going to be the one first chosen to farm, had been farming it for this owner for seven years, and that was the first day that his boots had ever been on the ground. Um, you know, so, you know, an awakening and an understanding that you need, to, you need to be looking, and one of the best tools, whenever I'm asked, you know, I mean, soil tests are great, agronomists are great, um, you know, all the technology that we have is great, but personal observation, you know, is the most reliable source of truth. You know, so what does healthy soil look like? Um, you know, the roots on the left, you know, is, is how you should be pulling, you know, roots out of the soil. Uh, you know, plants have an amazing ability to convert sunshine into sugars, which then feed soil biology, which create mucilage, which then is the building blocks, the biotic glues, uh, you know, that hold soils together and give us the aggregation that we want. The other thing about healthy soil, you know, you can travel anywhere in the world and you pick up a handful of what is believed to be healthy soil and it all smells the same. And, you know, that earthy smell is actually the result. Actinomycetes for the longest time was thought to be a fungi. It's actually a bacteria that kind of looks like a fungi, but it actually produces this geosmin and that, and that is basically the secondary metabolites, the body odor, for lack of a better term, of this soil organism is what makes soil that is healthy smell like health. that. That is that earthy smell. Is that geosmin? Obviously, you know, soil is uh, uh, soil health. These are the NRCS, um, you know, guidelines that are out there. Uh, you know, cover the soil, minimum disturbance, plant diversity, living root and livestock. Covering the soil, I think we do a pretty good job in organic. Um, you know, minimum disturbance. You know, it's tougher, right, with uh, tillage, uh, cultivation for weeds. But there's still ways that we uh, can thoughtfully disturb the soil from the standpoint of when we're doing it. And certainly, you know, uh, at least on our operation, and it, we try and never, uh, never disturb bare soil. Um, so, you know, even if we have to go out uh, with a spreader and broadcast a bushel of oats on a field that we have to plant late, even if we're going out there and it seems crazy because we're just working down three inch tall oats, we never, we never go across the field, you know, uh, and, and move bare soil. Plant diversity, talk a little bit about this today. Um, you know, and the previous presenter, um, you know, was, was talking about, you know, a diverse rotation as well. Um, you know, adding diversity in cover crops um, and a living root. And the other thing, um, I don't have a video of it here, but you know, integrating livestock isn't always practical. On my operation, it's certainly not. Um, and uh, you know, if that's the recommendation, I think it's going to be difficult to get livestock on every acre. So then the next thing that we have is, well, we'll just import manure, you know, from from you know a livestock operation off of our farm, and that's not the same. I mean, there's certainly some benefits, and there's certainly a return of nutrients, you know, but ultimately it's the it's the disturbance that that livestock does. 
one thing that I'd recommend that you look up is bioturbination. So, you know, if we can get 25 uh, worms per square foot in a in a in a in an agricultural field, that can result in upwards of 60 to 80 units of N a year. And if you watch any sort of a video on bioturbination and you see what how much litter and debris earthworms can move in a field, you know that if if it's not four-legged, you know beef livestock. It, you know that's your next best opportunity. So if you're out there with that shovel that I was talking about earlier, and you're not seeing earthworms in your field, you know one of your primary goals, one of your biggest holes to fill should be how do I get, you know how do I get earthworms back in my farm. Certainly there's there's uh, different approaches both in organic and conventional. Uh, a lot of our land we're looking at, uh, and and transitioning now is going to be rented ground. Um, I know Tor, you know, uh, addressed some long-term yesterday during organic transition talk, you know, the length of leases. Um, you know, what we typically do is we have what's called a rolling horizon lease. So we'll do three and five year agreements, but they always extend every year. So, you know, if I'm feeling I'm putting, you know, a ton of high cal lime down and I know I'm not going to get it back for three or four years, you know, I know, you know, that we can do that so that we're not never in that situation where we're impinged or impeded from putting the, the right soil amendment down or fixing that farm. But, you know, there's this fuel tank approach, uh, you know, where we put the inputs in to get the crop off that year. We fill the fuel tank, we drain it with the crop, we fill the fuel tank, we drain it with the crop, you know, and back and forth. You know, the other approach is to, is to look at it more from a flywheel standpoint, uh, you know, where we really look to encourage the system to function more holistically but to store energy, um, you know, organic matter uh, has an amazing capacity to store energy, but it has to be plugged in, you know. So if you're, if you're always running, you know, just on an empty and then full sort of a fuel tank approach versus really efforting to uh, gain momentum from a more systematic and flywheel approach, you'll never get the energy stored there that you can draw back, you know, at a later date. So, you know, picture your field as a big heavy metal wheel that's vertical, held up by an axle that goes through the center. You know, the first hard push doesn't yield much, nor the second or the third, but with constant effort, eventually a flywheel begins moving uh, at a good speed. At some point, the flywheel moves faster and faster with little effort relative to how fast the wheel is going. So, you know, the, the return on our efforts becomes disproportionately associated with, you know, with the results that we're getting. So, you know, these are the approaches that, that we've found to be uh, successful on our farm um, and uh, really looking at it from the standpoint of growing your own nitrogen. If you have organic matter soils, some of which could hold upwards of 1,000 or 2,000 pounds of nitrogen per 1% organic matter, that doesn't mean that the, that, the, that the nutrient is there. It just means that the organic matter has that capability to store it. So. You know, White Oak Farm, technically established in 1988, um, original family farm was 1898. Uh, we're in southeastern Wisconsin, 400 certified organic acres. Um, I'm a member of Crop Cooperatives Organic, um, um, their, their grower pool. There's about, of the 2,000 or so farmers in the country that are members of Crop, about 60 or 80 of us, and it varies from year to year, um, you know, grow grains for dairy farmers, my corn primarily goes to poultry, you know, egg producers. So we grow, you know, corn, barley, rye, and wheat for grain. Um, I also grow seed for Albert Lee Seed House. Um, uh, forage peas primarily, some barley, rye, and vetch. Then I also grow dry edible beans, alfalfa, and then we are fortunate enough to have uh, an organic sunflower oil company in Wisconsin. Uh, so we grow sunflowers for that, for that organic sunflower oil company as well. It all sounds simple, right? You know, and you know, how can you make a crop rotation look simple when it's a six-year uh, crop rotation? I'm not going to go too terribly into this. I think Tor did a great job this morning as far as showing what kind of options are out there. It's different for every farmer. It's different for every field. And certainly has impacts from the standpoint of year to year. But the whole idea, again, and the reason I sort of put them in the circle is to, is to continually look at this and maintain from the standpoint of our perspective a flywheel approach, you know, looking at a lot of the things that Tor was talking about, heavy feeders to light feeders, um, 
opportunities within that cycle to insert cover crops. Um, you know, so after corn, barley is a light feeder. Barley is not susceptible, even though it is a grass, it's one of the least susceptible small grains. Most people don't recommend growing a small grain, and I wouldn't either from the standpoint of wheats, but barley uh, seems to do extremely well after corn. But then that gives you the opportunity to get that barley off and get a really robust cover crop in there that's going to allow me to grow uh, anywhere between you know, 50 and 100 units of N. I can then grow dry beans, you know, come in with rye, you know, underseed the rye with clover, um, sunflowers, another robust cover crop, back to peas. The other thing in our, in our transition rotation, so on transition ground, we'll grow one year of vetch. And I don't re recommend growing vetch for anyone who's faint of heart. Uh, you know, it's like combining barbed wire fences, uh, uh, for if that gives you a good visual. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a crop that can grow a tremendous amount of nitrogen. Um, currently, even on the, on the transitional or conventional market, you know, is worth about a buck a pound for seed. And you can consistently grow 700 or 750 pounds of it um, per acre. So we'll grow vetch and then peas and then into corn. Um, and, and, you know, that really sets us up for, with, ex with the exception of what we're putting on our planter, and potentially depending upon how fertile and how productive, heavy or light the soils are, you know, we can grow uh, a respectable corn crop, um, you know, with little or no added nitrogen. My, my general rule is that, you know, when people are asking me from the standpoint of organic farming, you know, is that you should be able to do 10 or 15 percent better than your county average. You know, um, the, the, I feel it's a really a myth or a misnomer that just because it's organic, it has to be less yield. Um, you know, I don't think that you can get to those same yields that you maybe previously had. I feel you can certainly do as good or better than county average, but most likely you cannot do that on an input only basis. You know, you may be able to do it for a short period of time, but until you actually expand on rotations, and I understand rotations are driven by markets and markets are, you know, farmers are incentivized by markets that are going to buy product from them. So I'm very fortunate that where I'm at and how I've particularly, you know, connected with markets and the access to them, you know, that I can grow this very diverse and robust um, uh, rotation, but that, but that isn't always the case. The other thing about the small operation, and again, Tor did a great job on it today, um, I have a couple other jobs other than farming, and it isn't that... Uh, Quite frankly, you know, the 400 acres that we operate, um, you know, could, could be, uh, you know, a 100% farm income situation. Um, but, but the eight-year-old who turned into a composter turned into a compost company. And uh, for a period of time that I was away from the farm, I got into trucking, uh, liked big, shiny Peterbilt trucks. So, you know, we also have a transportation company. But with that going on, I'm pretty much, with the exception of my son and, and son-in-law who help periodically, you know, I'm the one that farms those 400 acres. So it's important to have the diverse rotation so that those planting dates are different. Uh, I have, you know, over half of the farm is in uh, cereal grains, you know, and, and winter, winter grain production. You know, I'm not, you know, if I'm planting corn, uh, we plant dry beans and sunflowers. You know, we plant corn the end of May. We plant dry beans and sunflowers, you know, the middle of June. You know, so I'm never trying to, and with a six-year rotation, I'm never trying to grow more than 50 or 60 acres, you know, of the same crop. So I can move from planting to fertilizing to, you know, rotary hoeing, tine weeding, cultivating, whatever it might be. So it spreads that workload around. If I was 200 acres of corn and 200 acres of soybeans, um, aside from the fact that I personally don't believe that I could do that on a continual basis and sustain that from my philosophy of a flywheel approach, it, 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 I don't know, you know, I don't know how we'd get over all of those acres, at least at the size that we are now, you know, running, you know, we're able to run six row equipment, you know, and relatively, um, be relatively nimble from that standpoint. But in a 10 year field history, you know, with that crop rotation that I showed earlier, the actual crops, and then typically we use about a six or seven way uh, um, cover crop mix, you know, we'll have literally 36 individual plantings of 25 different varieties in 10 years. You know, so again, back to the diversity, 
Each one of those plants has a different root architecture. Uh, it, it, it mines and liberates different nutrients from the soil, so it reaches a profile of the soil that's deeper than your corn root. Uh, it may access nutrients from that level that your corn root, even if it could go there, wouldn't necessarily access. Pumps those nutrients up to the surface of the soil where you can then feed it back, like Grandma said, you can go back to feeding the soil with that, with that biomass from that residue and literally move nutrients up from potentially a deeper layer, a deeper lens of your soil than your cash crop is accessing. Um, there's a quote from Gary Zimmer, you know, soil's not rocket science, it's a whole lot more complicated than that. Um, I, was, I was at a, uh, an organic sort of a summit uh, put on by a friend of mine in Washington, D.C. some years ago, and I don't know if any of you know Betsy Ross, not the lady who made our flag, but uh, uh, she runs a holistic grazing operation in Texas. Uh, as well as manages from a fertility and foliar spraying application about 200,000 acres of custom work. And, you know, her response to the people that were talking about, uh, you know, this whole situation of organics being complicated, uh, in her southern, you know, Texas drawl, she said, you know, it's, it's not complicated, it's just complex. And it got me thinking about that, you know, that we often confuse complexity with things that are complicated. Um, and a, and a, a complicated problem or something that is complicated requires complicated solutions. Complex problems, however, require simple solutions. So in changing Gary's quote about, you know, soil's not rocket science, it's a whole lot more complicated than that, I change that around and say it's a whole lot more complex than that because I think the solutions that we have to that very co complex component, which is the soils that we make our living off of, actually can be managed with very simple solutions. So, you know, the first thought when you look at this complicated versus complex, um, so remember now I'm either a first generation farmer or a third generation farmer. You know, my dad ends up being an engineer. The part I didn't tell you is that my mother was a psychologist. So I'm a very complex uh, first or third generation farmer. But can the brain deal with the immensity of the soil system? Um, you know, so that, that's one of the challenges that we have when we're trying to really understand our, our relationship as agrarians, you know, with that system. Uh, you know, a handful of healthy soil, I know this poster's out a lot and it gets pushed around a lot, but, you know, a handful of healthy soil contains more living organisms than there are humans on Earth. Most people just glaze over when I tell them that. They're like, how can that be? I mean, they're just, you know, so we, don't, we can't deal with big numbers. So I try to put it in a little bit different perspective. This is a study out of Europe, so it was in hectares. But if you break it down to acres, it's, you know, the, the life, in, and we're talking about healthy soil now. And this is bacteria, fungi, all the way down to arthropods, microarthropods, you know, beetles, bugs, and earthworms, you know, can be as much as 8.4 cows per acre. So, you know, Grandma was kind of right when it came to feeding the soil. You know, if any of us looked out at our fields, and felt that we had our soils humming along and were the healthiest they could be, and there was eight cows standing on every acre, we wouldn't, we wouldn't even give it a second thought about feeding it. But because we don't see it and it's unseen, um, oftentimes it isn't that we're ignoring it, it's just, you know, our, you know, it's our physiology, our brain can't get around it. So if we break that down from the handful of soil, right, that contains more living organisms than there are people on Earth, try and break that down into a smaller piece. Now we're talking about a teaspoon of soil. Um, and a teaspoon of soil, uh, if you were to count the organisms in a teaspoon of soil, the average person can count to 150 in 30 seconds. Does anybody have any idea how, you, how, how long it would take you if you counted 24-7, 365, how, how long it would take you to count the organisms in just a teaspoon of healthy soil? Six and a half years. The other thing that's difficult is, you know, is, is one a big number, right? So, you know, we listen to the news all the time. We're looking at GDP, we want it to be 2 or 3%. We want our home values to go up 5%. You know, we're paying X percent on our mortgages. We're getting this percent on, our, um, on the savings that we have. None of us seem to be really too crazy about, about uh, just 1%. But 1% organic matter 
um, you know, can store 15 to 20,000 gallons of water. And if you look at some of the numbers down below, like I was talking about, you know, if, if you use that as a battery, as a, as, a, as, a, as a function of soil to store energy and nutrients, you know, 1% of our organic matter, you know, on the low end, you know, can hold 1,000 pounds of nitrogen. And then if you look at how that nitrogen mineralizes out, again, depending upon your soils, depending upon your climate and how healthy they are, you can mineralize back out of that anywhere from 1% to 3%. But again, if, if the battery isn't charged, it, you, you can't draw that back out from it. So when we're talking about growing our own nitrogen and, and developing these cover crops, it's like that flywheel approach. The first push, the second push, the third push sometimes does not result in what we're absolutely looking for. But eventually, by building that momentum and that energy and that synergy, you know, we can start to get to the point where those soil organic matters, not only the soil organic matters are increasing, um, you know, which is a goal of, of most farmers and certainly organic farmers, but then the mineralization of the nitrogen that's stored in that organic matter. All again to try and reduce inputs. The other thing, um, you know, that, that challenges us all as humans, but as farmers is our desperate desire for technology, right? I mean, I've got a smartphone in my hand. Um, you know, we've got smartphones, smart TVs, smart speakers. I was getting on a plane, come back from Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago, and a lady sat down next to me with a bottle of smart water. I mean, I don't even know. <laughs> you know so, um, and this has been going on for a long time. So it's not our recent um, fascination with iPhones. This is, this, is, this is the block of wood we're cut out of. Um, you know, so you can go back, you know, almost 100 years, and we were trying to figure out ways to farm more, you know, with less. I think it's funny as a, an organic conference like this, you know, we're seeing a lot of uh, new tools coming out there from a weed management standpoint. And I think, you know, weed management talks, you know, are always standing room only talks at organic conferences. Um, but this is a picture from International Harvester, which is in Racine, Wisconsin. In 1949, they were experimenting with flame weeders. You know, and some people feel this is the direction that agriculture is going. I personally don't. Um, you know, back to the shovel in the pickup truck mode, you know, that's eyes to acre ratio as Wendell Berry refers to it. You know, we, we need more farmers. We need more farmers on, on or, or, or an ability for, for uh, learned agrarians to be actually observing and interacting with more acres. And then the final thing is, you know, is ecology stupid, right? You know, we take this top-down approach, you know, that, that somehow nature and everything that we have out there has been put here uh, to serve us. Um, anybody read the book, The World Without Us, that's, uh, the author went to all the places where we're not anymore. You know, Chernobyl, there's a um, zone between Nicaragua and Guatemala that has been, uh, you know, de demilitarized. You know, you know, so anywhere we've, we've been, um, and then we ultimately leave, it takes only a few short decades and you wouldn't know that humans were there. So, you know, understanding that even as agrarians and as farmers, you know, we're part of that natural system. So, you know, why our brains don't help? Fear of the unknown or the unusual. So obviously when we're looking at bacteria and fungi and things that we can't see in the soil, we have a, a propensity for simplistic linear thinking, right? We want uh, you know, certainly from a farming standpoint, we want seed, seed genetics, timing, planting date, depth, all these things, and we want it to just sort of track out so that we know at the end that there's this result. Back to our desperate need for technology, um, the desperate link to cause, you know, to, 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 to link, you know, effects and cause together. Uh, so, you know, when we're looking at inputs, uh, oftentimes, you know, we're wanting to try and have that relate directly back to bushels and, and um, you know, quality oftentimes and certainly with the with growing food grade products and seed um, you know the seed house can't take seed that's lightweight under test weight you know doesn't have a high germ rate you know those are all the same qualities that need to be incorporated into a food grade crop as well and in any instance where you know we've looked to increase quality you know yield has always come along for the ride um, you know so getting that nutrient density I think um, you know, certainly in the, in the consumer packaged goods and the food system, there's an increasing awareness, um, you know, of not only just food in the form of something that tastes good and calories, you know, but also nutrient density in that food. 
Um, like Hippocrates says, you know, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Uh, back to difficulty dealing with numbers. We have this hopeless, um, hopelessness with compound growth, right? We want that GDP 3%, so, you know, the 1% organic matter thing. And then the final thing is that we're loss adverse. So looking at growing your own nitrogen, um, looking at, you know, how that would necessarily work in a, in a farming system, we're, again, as humans, wired that we don't want to take that risk because if we don't put enough nitrogen on, because somewhere, somehow I read or I was taught or believed or whatever happened that I need X number of units of nitrogen per bushel of corn, that if I don't put it there, I'm not going to get that crop. So we're loss adverse. So we put it there whether we need it or not. Or, or we're, we're certainly motivated to, incentivized to do that. It was at the Corn Soy Expo, um, of all places, and uh, this is a retired um, EPA scientist, but he said if we spend as much time resources on soil biology as we have soil chemistry in the last 50 or 100 years, we would be in a totally different place in agriculture and our understanding of soil plant relationships. I didn't put his name on there because he didn't want me to do that because he's still out and about. Uh, but, you know, the fact that we have people that are now sort of, um, you know, in the autumn of their careers or, or moving out of, of institutions like the EPA or the USDA, and while they were in there, and certainly now while they're out, they're, they have this understanding that, you know, maybe when it comes to the complexity of soil um, and, and the soil plant system, you know, that we focused too heavily potentially, or, or not, not too heavily, but uh, maybe one-sidedly on chemistry, and the, and the biology has been sort of left out of the key. So the large green circle represents, you know, all of what is believed by science to be the total soil biology that exists. That uh, lighter green inner circle it represents and depends on the, the scientific community that you look at, but anywhere between 5 and 20 percent of the total amount of soil biology that is, is believed to exist in healthy soils, only 5 to 20 percent of it we know what it is. And then of that uh, total, only about 1 percent of it can be cultured in a lab. So, you know, studying it is, is really difficult because we can't, you know, use a lab. We have to do it out in the field. This is a study from 2006. So over the past 100 years, microbiologists have attempted to characterize the biodiversity of microbial life in the soil, and many had reached the unsatisfactory conclusion that bacteria may be too diverse to count. Um, so, you know, if you think about that, and again, that whole complex versus complicated issue, I guess I don't really feel that I need to try and understand how many hundreds of thousands of bacteria are there, or who they are, or who's eating who, or who helps who and who doesn't, you know, help. So, you know, the the whole goal really is to, you know, look at the geological component, you know, the chemistry component of soils, uh, which, you know, for, for some time we've had uh, beliefs that if we just simply address that, you know, manage the physical conditions, the air, you know, water, uh, and textural components of soil, and just manage the chemistry components, you know, we'd get a crop. The reality is, is that, you know, that geology uh, is codependent on biology, so that the both need a balance. Uh, we need to be managing both the biological uh, nature and, and uh, constituents of our soil as equally and as importantly, you know, as the geological. This is just a brief um, sort of depiction of the fact that, that soil biology, their codependence uh, is what I'm trying to demonstrate here. Basically to the left, you know, we have soils, prairie lands and grasslands. And as those soils um, either, either change because of the plants that are growing in them or the plants grow in them because of the change of the soil is the relatively unknown part. But those soils and grasslands and things are more bacterially dominant. And as you move into these forests uh, and, and woodlands, you know, they become more fungally dominant. And that's the relationship, the symbiotic relationship between the root exudates of the plant and the biology that supports those root exudates. You know, and ultimately, um, in agriculture, it, just like in those other soils, the, 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 um, the plant's the referee. So when you look at uh, whatever crop we're growing and in that diverse rotation, the, the root exudates, the sugars and carbohydrates that are products of photosynthesis, and I'm probably preaching to the choir on this, but you know they pump into the soil 
and they can even change during the course of their growth the composition of those root exudates to feed different organisms in the soil and those organisms in the soil function to either protect them and, and, and provide uh, a way to resist disease or insect or they, they are multiplied and are sent out into the soil to liberate nutrients and bring them back to the plant. So the soil food web, this is an older document. Um, I really feel it needs to be updated. But, you know, quick overview, sun, photosynthesis, sugars and carbohydrates down into the roots. And then there's this whole trophic layer of, you know, sort of a who eats who kind of a component. And that's about as advanced as we are from the standpoint of the soil food web and the biology part of it. On the chemistry part, um, you know, it all pretty much ties back to this guy in the 1600s, you know, where it was determined that based on whatever the lowest amount of a nutrient was in your soil, that was going to be your limiting factor. Um, you know, the, 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 the part that's hard for me to really comprehend from the standpoint of using either one or the other, and there are people out there, um, you know, that profess that all you need is biology. And there's others that are out there professing that all you need is minerals, nutrients, or chemistry. And, you know, I think there's a, there's a growing knowledge and an understanding that neither of them are wrong and neither of them are right. You know, and that, that codependence and that balance. If you look at this picture, you know, this is Midwest Labs, the lab that we use. But, you know, 18,000 soil tests a day they do at the height of their, their soil testing season. You know, and you look at the, the, the variation in just, you know, that one picture of the soils. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to, you know, stand here or stand in front of anyone and say that what works on one farm, what works in one of those little cups of soil that's being tested and the analysis that's derived from it, you know, is going to work on the cup next to it, you know, and the farm field next to it. But, uh, you know, turning that into an actionable plan, you know, you get these soil tests, they're hard to read. Um, you know, we've, we've worked for some time now on just sort of the NPK philosophy. Um, you know, the, the micronutrients, uh, you know, were added. Certainly when I was in, in high school, N NPK was pretty much, um, you know, all that was really believed as far as necessity from a plant growth standpoint. Um, you know, you start adding, you know, the trace elements, and now, you know, you get to a, an elemental chart uh, you know, at least uh, a wide variety of today's thinkers in the agricultural world and, and uh, plant soil relationship world, you know, have upwards of 50 different elements that, that uh, you know, that are a requirement. And I understand that it's easy to look just at the NPKs and you're here to learn about growing nitrogen, but you have to understand that when you, just like the, the bringing the quality of a crop up brings the yield up, when you bring, uh, you know, naturally cycling, cycling nutrients into a system, just because the calculations are there that show that, you know, 1% organic matter can, uh, you know, hold 1,000 pounds of nitrogen doesn't mean that um, your, your, your plant, ha you know, your soil has it, but also making sure that once you get to that point, you're going to be bringing other nutrients out in that process when you have the, the biological community, you know, functioning properly. An example of that, <clears throat> this is on a, a field that we transitioned to organic starting in 2009. And I, I sort of wanted to test this theory. Um, the, the red bars are off the chart because you can send a soil test in to Midwest Labs, for instance, and ask uh, for a PT2. So, you know, we send plant tissue tests in for crops that we're growing or forage analysis, and they'll, they'll put it into a machine, and it'll, it'll blow it up, and it'll tell them right down to the molecule how many different nutrients and at what quantity levels they are. So you can send this soil test in. You can have that done to your soil. They refer to it as total testing. But that test came back that there was 700 pounds of phosphorus. This has been, this has been a conventionally farmed field. You know, um, dairy guys that, that both retired, you know, went no-till for 30 years, you know, stripped in anhydrous, map dap, and 0060, you know, for 30 years. Fortunately, what they'd done in that amount of time is they'd put a lot of phosphorus in the bank for me when I started farming it. So 700 parts per million of phosphorus, but when it, when it came out on the soil test, um, and this was actually one of the good spots on the field where, you know, it was about 30 parts per million, but there were some, some portions of that field that were in the teens from the standpoint of what, what a soil test was showing us as far as phosphorus availability. And the reality is that the biology in the soil, 
didn't have a job to do. You know, so phosphorus libera liberation was not occurring because soluble phosphorus was always there. Those organisms just stayed on the couch eating potato chips and didn't have a job to do. But through the time of, of just five years, you know, we were able to increase the phosphorus level by over 100 pounds without adding any phosphorus to the field. So the job of bacteria, you know, obviously is to fix nitrogen, cycle and mineralize it, solubilize rock, vitamin production, hormone production, and enzyme production. That's a picture, you know, basically of a soil, uh, you know, under a microscope at, at, uh, at my office. If we break that down a little bit when you're looking at it, you know, you start to understand that, you know, in all of that is the organic matter and it'll come into focus a little bit for you as I start, start to move along a little bit. But that, you know, that, that's the unseen and the unusual part of it that, that we just, unless you're somebody like me who, you know, on the credenza of your desk has a microscope, you know, and you look at this stuff all the time, you know, most people um, may have a passing or novel interest in it, and then they move on to the job at hand. You know, we, we can certainly, while we're out with that shovel in the back of our pickup truck, you know, look at it. And, you know, in root nodules such as this, obviously, we can feel pretty good about the fact that we at least have a species of bacteria doing a particular job. You know, but fungi, which are the other thing that from a cultural practice standpoint, shallow incorporation of crop residues, minimum disturbance of the soil, thoughtful disturbance of the soil, however we want to look at it, and even that approach of taking a very small cover crop down, which seems senseless, um, you know, but, but I was at a, a field over on the western part of the state that had 15 inches of rain last year, and they had, it's a vegetable operation, and they just had the opportunity to get their rye cover in on some of their carrot beds, and you had to walk out to the field to see the rye. I mean, it was just coming up out of the ground. And there were two fields, you know, sort of co-joined with a big hill alongside of it. The, the field that had just that little bitty rye cover crop coming up had almost no erosion. And the field beyond it that didn't get the cover crop in, and again, you had to walk out in the field to see it. But those roots, the sugars and carbohydrates, that biotic glue from even just that smallest cover crop saved that guy's field from washing into the Bad Axe River. So, you know, the, the, you know, having a living root and putting something back in from a cover crop standpoint, you know, I think is really critical. Um, these are just some pictures. This particular fungi is probably a product that you have seen or maybe even have used. This is Bavera bassiana. You know, so this is a beneficial soil organism that at high enough levels, and usually to get high enough levels, you have to buy it and, and put it on a seed or use it on your crop. Um, but that actually has the ability to then infect and use the chitin from the shells of, you know, hard-shelled insects as its food source. So, you know, when we're looking at natural ways to manage pest and disease. This one just shows some of the, the spores, you know, and the fungal hyphae. And you can see just how delicate that would be if we ran, you know, a chisel paw through it. Um, fungi as well on the leaf surface of a plant perform the same functions. They can cycle nutrients on the leaf surface. They can provide protection on the leaf surface. This is actually fungi on the leaf of a uh, tomato plant. I'm gonna see how this video works here. Nice. So, you know, this this actually, I don't know, let me see, we're up there. right now okay bear with me folks
Sure. Right. I mean, even if there was a way to just get back down to the PowerPoint and keep going. So while we're getting this thing back going again, um, I wouldn't even bother trying to. Okay. Yeah, can we just X out of it? Yeah. So what this is, um, and you've all had plenty of time to memorize that YouTube location on the internet, um, is a, a, a recent discovery that you know non-motile bacteria. So these are bacteria that. Um, I still don't have my PowerPoint back up here, Chief. I'll keep messing with it and try and get it ready, but it is switching now. Okay, it is. All right. So the, um, yeah, I just don't know how far forward we got there. So yeah, that, that video was basically showing that uh, bacteria were using a thin layer of mucilage on the outside of fungi to travel like, and the video's name is called the fungal highway. So the, the importance that I was trying to demonstrate there was, um, and now we're getting some hip music here, cool, uh, was, was the fact that, um, you know, the symbiotic relationships, not only between, between plants and soil organisms, but between soil organisms themselves. So we use oftentimes sort of a reductionist science approach, right, where we want to use this particular fungi. That's why the Bavera bassiana slide was there, right? We think, okay, here's this one fungi that does this one great thing in our agricultural systems. I want that fungi. The reality is that what we really want is all the fungi. Um, and it's the, it's the interdependence. When we look back to that slide that you know only one percent of the, all the soil biology that's that's believed to exist out there can be cultured in a lab and only five to twenty percent of it we know about all these other symbiotic and synergistic connections are still you know probably decades away but that video shows very clearly and sort of impressively this synergistic relationship where we where you know again as humans we've sort of broken it down into this single reductionist component um, it, you know, and, and uh, in reality, all these agro ecosystem uh, services could be functioning, you know, at a much uh, more uh, sort of fascinating rate. Um, and and there's there's so little of it that we even know. So the this feeding frenzy and the reason why we want to get higher counts of bacteria in the soil and how we take and, and actually store that energy in that one. So the 1% organic matter is the house for the biology. And then that biology has varying degrees of carbon to nitrogen ratios. And in that process, in this you know feeding frenzy, so to speak, we have the ability to then cycle that nutrient. You know, so we take uh, you know, soluble uh, nitrogen that is leaking from you know the 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 work down cover crop that we have, or from the the nitrogen that was fixed by um, a legume in our rotation or our cover crop, and then at the point in time that the, the the you know the plant needs that biology back, it feeds that biology. These uh, organisms have the ability to double in population every 20 minutes under the right circumstance. So you know sunny day, sugar and carbohydrate pumped down into the soil. Bacteria proliferate, you know, they're all coming along at this five to one, a very high amount of nitrogen per molecule of carbon. And then other organisms in that food chain below the soil consume them and don't need that nitrogen. You know, so that, that's a, a relatively hard thing for a lot of people to comprehend from the standpoint of, of nitrogen liberation from the standpoint of the trophic layers of the soil food web. But ultimately, if you look at it just simply from the standpoint, no differently than any other crop we would want to grow or stocking density on acres of grazing land, if we can increase that biological population, uh, hopefully at the lowest of those trophic layers um, and, and have diversity and robustness in that biology, we can then uh, basically create a food source that allows for the liberation of that nitrogen. And, it, and the, the more amazing thing about it is that liberation occurs at a plant regulated, you know, back to the plant that had the, the coach's jersey on it, you know, the plant has the ability 
through the feeding of sugars and carbohydrates, if that biology is there, to, to uh, basically allocate uh, you know, how much uh, sugar and carbohydrates goes to the bacteria, and then ultimately how much of the nutrient that's in that bacteria it, you know, is returned to the plant. Back to that root again, biology. Um, I think it's Ray Archuleta that says without biology, all you have is geology. Um, you know, but you know, when you look at geology, you know, from this perspective, it's easy to understand, you know, rocks and minerals and, and ancient um, components of how the earth's crust and ultimately the lenses of soil that we farm today, you know, were created. This is actually an electron microscope picture of a piece of sand. And the green spots on that piece of sand are bacteria. So a lot of times we look at light soils and we don't feel that there's really a lot of opportunity for biological activity in, in, in some of our lighter soils. And I just thought that this was interesting to look at from the standpoint that, again, back to that ability of that bacteria to sequester nitrogen in its body and then give up that nitrogen at a later date when the plant literally asks for it by sharing those sugars and carbohydrates. The feed the soil part, um, this is a farmer who uh, actually grows potatoes. And the potatoes are grown uh, typically in this part of the country uh, one out of every four or five years. Um, what he chose to do is go into an extremely intensive uh, soil, uh, soil health year, you know, basically soil building year, and then right back to potatoes again. Um, you know, I, I think that this is certainly an option you know, when we're looking at trying to have, maybe we don't have markets for uh, the other six years of a rotation like uh, Tor and I have been talking about, and corn and beans might be you know, all the markets that you have. But you know, understanding that building that nitrogen base and having that biological activity, you know, there is a possibility that we could potentially pull off a year uh, you know, of crop production, you know, build that soil and go back and ultimately reduce inputs, you know, increase yields, and, and have an opportunity, not necessarily at that point in time, to manage another crop other than those eight cows that are, that are uh, you know, related to underneath. So a couple of real quick things here. Um, Jack Schultz, he's now uh, actually at the University of Toledo. Another, you know, just unsung hero from the standpoint of understanding soil biology. And, and, and the reason that I want to try and bring these things up, because as we talk about growing our own nitrogen, uh, we also have to understand that we're going to be bringing these other micronutrients and trace elements. You know, we talk about, you know, boron, right? I mean, 2 million pounds of soil and the ideal or believed to be ideal level of boron is 4 pounds. So, you know, how, how many pounds or parts of pounds do we need of molybdenum or cobalt or chromium? You know, those haven't even been determined yet. But they, do, they have been determined that of those 50 or so trace elements, plants still uh, need to utilize them from the standpoint of expressing themselves to their full genetic potential. So he's determined that there's over 700 receptors on plants. They use these receptors both above ground and below ground. And they use those receptors to pick up uh, you know, ultimately chemical compounds that they create. And all of these chemical compounds have to be created with an elemental cofactor. You know, so now when we're talking about, you know, two tenths of a part per billion of cobalt or chromium or, or molybdenum, you know, that compound wouldn't exist. So Jack has been somewhat ridiculed over the last 35 years. Um, because what his original study showed is that he could put a plant in this glass cloche on the front, put a chewing insect on that plant, take the air from that cloche through a mass spectrometer, measure what the volatile organic compounds were that were in it, and then feed that air to two plants that didn't have an insect on them, and the two plants that didn't have an insect on them responded exactly as if they'd been being chewed by an insect. You know, this is what we're seeing with some of the biologicals on the market, like regalia from Marone Bio Innovations. It's called induced systemic resistance. You know, plants have the ability to take that compound, you know, and, and trigger another plant to realize that it has that, that defense mechanism. Um, we're, about out of time. we're about out of time. We have time for questions. Sure. Sorry about that, guys. Any questions? Any questions for Sandy? I guess if not, I mean, um, we could go for another couple minutes. Uh, lunch is getting set up out here, so. People are hungry.
that could be too. What was part of that potato mix that you're talking about? Um, could you repeat the question? Sorry. So he said, what was the part of that potato mix that I was talking about? The, so they, they, uh, they harvest their potatoes and they're not russets or, you know, um, you know, that type of a stored potato. Most of it's fingerlings and small colored potatoes. Um, you know, but they put usually a ton or two of a composted um, manure. Uh, and then, you know, the cover crop mix is about six or eight different species. I'd have to get you the actual species. The other thing that he also does though, uh, because he's not using, even though he's not organic, he's not using herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, he interseeds his potatoes uh, with cowpeas. Um, you know, so he's, he's using that synergistic capability and attracting pollinators and those sorts of things. And that obviously prevents him from using any, any herbicides as well. Yes, sir. Um, so our testing on our product is uh, about 200 species of bacteria and about 100 species of fungi from a DNA and RNA standpoint. And again, those are only the, the species that scientists know what they are. Um, you know, if you look at an RNA or a DNA test, you know, it'll have a whole slew of unclassified because they don't, they don't know what they are. Any other questions for Sandy? Okay, well, let's thank him for uh, sharing that information and coming over with us today.